of the time, training, or the inclination for strategic thoughts. Let's play this play this Beep. Beep. That was my recorder running out of batteries. Oh. Yeah. Hi, hi, hi. Hi, hi, hi. How are you doing? It's going. Oh, I know. Good, good, good. What's going on, boys? Not too much. How are you? Yeah. Oh, I'm tired. Why? Well, was you partying all weekend? I don't know me, though. I, well, I did go out Saturday night, but yeah. I went to the gym today, and I've been working on some stuff ever since. You get my email? Uh, For like our like historic or for us? Yeah. Uh yeah, let me just check to see if it's one from earlier today or did you just send it. Yeah, man. I don't think you should be sending that picture on uh work email. It's pretty oh, yeah. Where did you send a, me a dick pic over a work email? That's I didn't a... send you a dick pic. Well, I, mean, <laughs> I mean it's just a picture of your face, but like I look like a penis. But you're a dick. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. All right. What's, here. Up? What's up? How you doing? How's it going, guys? Pretty hey. good. How are you? Not too shabby. Not too shabby. Not too art. great either, but you know, surviving. Yeah. Why? What's nice. wrong? Uh, I have a broken ankle. Holy shit. What'd you do? Uh, there's not even a, a particularly good story to it. I was helping a friend uh, move and I stepped in a pothole. Oh my God. God damn. Yeah. That, it's fucking New York for you, man. It Gotta really fix is. the roads. <laughs> Well, look at you, man. You're covered in art. You got art on your body. You got art on your shirt. You got paint on your shirt. You got art on your walls. Do all the art shit. I'm the art guy. So the art I live my life. Have, have you um have you heard of Dennis Osadebe? I haven't. I have no idea who that is. He's an artist. Oh I I should have known. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I have every artist memorized. <laughs> Basically, every time you ask one of our guests if they know a person, they have never known who you're talking about. Well, that's because I'm a refined. I have a refined palate. I I know things that other people don't know. I'm you know I'm cool. One day you'll strike gold, and someone will know, and you'll have that amazing moment. But you know, and then and then I'll be like, oh, cool, and then we'll move <laughs> and on. you'll shuffle on, yeah, yeah. So, Andrew, would you like to tell us who we're speaking to today? No. Sean, we must do it. <laughs> uh, today is TK Mills. He's the founder, editor of Up Magazine, the, the premier zine of the street art community of New York City and America as a whole. He's uh, been working on this for four or five years now, right? Uh, more or less. Well, all right. Well, yeah, you just say yes or no. It's been four or five years. <laughs> <laughs> it's about uh, three years I've been doing it, but. Well, then say no. If I say four years and you've been doing it three, just say... I mean, you, you, you're talking up my uh, my spot. I mean, I might as well bask in the, the glory, right? Yeah, and yeah. he's also my brother. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't realize you guys looked so much alike until just yeah. now. So really you see know. both our faces on a screen? Yeah, like right side by side. Yeah. Uh, I feel like we have similar head structure, but like, you know, then it starts to differ a bit. Similar well, beards a little bit, I guess, but like. You uh, got the nose, you got the brows, you got, you got the mouth. Mm. We're bit. surrounded. <laughs> we're, sh we're Sean rounded. We're Sean rounded. Yeah. yeah. TK, as he's known in the community. What does that stand for? Taekwon? Uh, You got it. <laughs> Taekwon, Taekwon, and then my middle name is Doze. Nice. Ooh. <laughs> Multiple. What is TK? Where's the, what's the TK origin? Uh, so funny enough, um, when I first started writing, I, uh, you know, so, so I feel like I got to like backtrack a little bit and give context. So I didn't go, I was never an art kid. I was never really someone who cared or, or was that invested in art. I did politics. Mm -hmm. What I went to school for was very, you know, all full of myself, 
on that high that people get when they they feel like they know things. And uh, so I studied politics for several years and uh, and then 2016 happened, 2016 election. And uh, basically, I learned that, you know, the, the world is actually controlled by memes. The world is controlled by weaponized memes. And I realized that all of my education was uh, was basically put to waste. And so I went to Cuba and I, I kind of just went there to drink and, and feel, you know, have a good time. Yeah. Uh, so I was I was in a cafe feeling like I was a, a wannabe Hemingway. And I was kind of like, well, what do I actually want to do with my life at this point now that I've, you know, squandered the past six years studying politics? I was like, well, I've always been a big reader. I always liked the idea of like writing. I'll be a writer. So so I kind of put myself to a test. I'm like, all right, while I'm here in Cuba, uh, I'm going to write something. And if I can actually get it published, I'll I'll be a writer. And so I was kind of just meandering around Havana and I ended up coming across this graffiti that said, two plus two equals five, um, which I thought was cool. I recognized it as like a reference to George Orwell's 1984, which uh, back then, this is now like timeline wise, this is like circa January, 2017. So 1984 seemed very relevant. Um, And I was kind of like, all right, well, let me figure out what this is about. And so basically I, I tracked down the artist by, you know, just kind of like asking around town Ended up interviewing him and uh, ended up getting the story published in this London magazine. I was like, oh, cool. I'll be a writer. But when I got it published, I was still I was kind of hedging my bets because I was like, oh, well, you know, this is a little risque for the the political world. I should pick up a pen name, you know, just so I doesn't come back and bite me in the ass. But also just because it was kind of like putting on a new identity. So I was like, all right, well, what's my name going to be? And so initially I was in my, this is after I had come back for a minute and I was in my bedroom and I was like, oh, well, there's a, it's kind of looking at all these books. And I was just like looking at other author writer names. And there was one uh, political philosopher that I liked, uh, John Stuart Mill. So mm-hmm. I was like, oh, I like that Mill, Mills. It's good flow. It sounds very American. So I took, uh, took Mills and then uh, I was like, well, initials seem to work well with uh with writers so i was like all right well i like the letter t you know t mills but i was like no nah, it needs a middle initial so Wait, i basically how, just you gotta explain how you got to the why do you like the letter t i feel like he's a great letter it's very versatile you know it's <laughs> it's like it works for a lot of things because i and the the tk i mean it's a great combo because i was like well tj i'm like well that that's like kind of overplayed but, you know, I, I kind of was, I was rolling through the letters. I got to the TK and I was like, well, the only other TK I've ever heard of was that character in Digimon. And he was kind of oh, cool. Yeah. And so I was like, oh, TK. And uh, yeah, so I, I basically just rolled with it. And I'm a big Digimon fan. Yeah, uh, right. And uh, that's funny. TJ Mills is so close to TJ Miller. Yeah, right. I didn't even think about that, but I'm, I'm glad I didn't just, <laughs> you know uh you want you want to stay original but yeah no uh, tk works and it's funny at this point in my life i think more people i know at least like friends colleagues works whatever they know me more as tk than they know me as my actual uh actual name but that's also not that uncommon in the the art sphere Um, a lot of people know me as breast milk in the comedy community nice because i uh i drink breast milk at every show i do nice where who's your supplier Mm, i can't i can't talk about it (laughs) she's undocumented (laughs) can't let my origin story slip um but yeah that was basically uh the the tk origin in in a nutshell is like yeah i thought those letters sounded nice together and i was like i'll run with it and then i get asked all the time what does TK stand for? And I always let people guess and I've gotten some pretty good ones. I think, uh, I think my favorite was someone said Thaddeus Kingsley and that sounded so regal that I was like, yeah, that's the one I'm going to like, that's, that's the one I'm going to keep for when people really press me, you know, Thaddeus Kingsley Mills, right? Thaddeus. (laughs) (laughs) That's a hard one to say if you're shit faced. (laughs) Thaddeus. Oh, those Kingsley Mills. Kingsley Mills. All right, so that's how you got into the origin of your writing. 
Like, so where did the street art come into it all? Like, the are you, know, you getting really into the whole scene of it all? Yeah, so basically, I, you know, after that trip to Cuba, I did the graffiti article, and I was like, well, that was cool. And uh, at the time, I lived in Bushwick, and uh, truthfully, I, I lived in Bushwick because uh, the train was pretty close to where I got off for grad school, and it was cheap. Um you know, I, I, back in the day, I was really just like commuting into Manhattan, like didn't even really pay attention to Brooklyn. But after the Cuba trip, I, I had graduated school and I was kind of like looking around. And I was like, well, there's a lot of, you know, art and graffiti here. And I, it, it was like, kind of like, you know, you see it and it was like visual white noise. Like you'd be like, oh, that's cool. But like after this trip, I like really started to look at it. You know, started looking, noticing that there was like people would put their Instagram tags on like their art and started following them on Instagram and, you know, kind of diving into the rabbit hole. Um, and then from there, I basically I was like, well, you know, writing wise, I like kind of have a, a little like this art shit was cool. So I was like, all right, I'll 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 make art writing my niche. And so I kind of just started going to art shows to start interviewing artists, really had like zero experience or, or you know reason for doing it other than i was like well fuck it this seems fun yeah and uh you know i I did it for a couple months kind of freelance around for a couple different publications and you know built a little bit of a name for myself and got kind of into the art community but specifically the street art community uh just because i found that street art you know it's just a little bit more fun it's like a little bit more as an art form it's a little bit more accessible it's like not pretentious like fine art and you know in the fine art world where people like, you know, they won't talk to you unless you have a college degree from someplace that, you know, with student right. loans, you'll never be able to repay. Yeah. I, I worked yeah. at, uh, I worked at Dia Beacon for about a year. So uh-huh. I know all about the pretentious side of art. I, I can imagine. I feel like that's like where people go for their pilgrimage. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> really but I, girls go to get a good Instagram photo of look how sophisticated I am at this art thing. Yeah. yeah. But this- I actually liked it. Once, once I, once I got like over the fact that how that it was pretentious, at least it was talked about pretentiously, like mm-hmm. it, it kind of did grow on me. The art. Yeah. And I feel like the art world is like, you tend to meet like fun, creative people, you know, yeah. little, little sprinklings of uh, pretentiousness in there. Did, did you get to go to five points before they tore it down? Uh, I didn't actually, which is uh, one of my biggest regrets, but it's interesting. Five points is like uh it's it's really it's almost like a holy site in graffiti culture graffiti yeah. really more than street art um For people who don't know what was five points like what was there so five, five points was basically this building in long island city that had started in i don't know the specific dates but i want to say like mid early mid 90s um and it was basically an abandoned building because back then it you know, before New York hyper gentrified, there was all these old factories that, you know, were too expensive to run. It was basically a burnt out building and uh, it became sort of a graffiti spot where artists would come and, uh, you know, paint up their name. Um, And it it kind of developed reputation and it went through a couple of hands, but, you know, the the primary curator was uh, this guy, Mears, Mears One. Um, And it, it kind of grew you know, to the sort of stature in the culture, uh, particularly pre-social media, where, um, you know, writers, because graffiti artists call themselves writers uh, because it's writing your name. Um, But yeah, so graffiti writers would come from Europe, South America, all around the world and come paint at the spot. Um, So Five Points kind of developed a legacy. And uh, as is the cyclical nature of gentrification, eventually uh, it became cool. And it became something that could be commodified. And basically the owner and the curator had a disagreement. And in the middle of the night, the owner uh, buffed the entire building, which is buffing is basically you erase all the art, wash, power wash it or whatever it off. And, uh, and then later destroyed that building and turned it into a condo and now calls the condo five points. Um, so the, the sheer, uh, you know gall of just like literally destroying a culture and then you know taking that name to sell people overpriced rentals uh tends to rub people the wrong way so five points still has a it comes up a lot in conversations 
Yeah, that place was magical. Like I remember just visiting it over and over again. Like when I first started comedy, I'd do my mics around there and just like mm-hmm. just go walk around the building. And there's so many cool like different pieces. Yeah, uh, it's uh, it's and people have tried to rebuild Five Points, but it it hasn't really taken off anywhere else. You know, um, but yeah, it's uh, it's it's interesting. They actually so. There's a there's a minor controversy currently going around the street art graffiti scene where um, they are uh, basically recruiting artists to paint the condos, um, but a lot of artists consider that sort of sacrilegious because of you know everything that went down, um, and so it's uh, it's become a point of uh, contention. The old uh, how dare you want to get paid for your art? Well, that's the thing. They want these artists to come in and paint, but they're not even paying them. Oh, they're not. Is, oh, wow. No, yeah. you would be surprised. I mean, so many artists, it's very, very hard to really make any serious money off your art, mm. um, particularly in street art, because so many people just paint for the love of painting that, you know, even if uh, you won't paint it, the curators will be like, well, that guy will, you know? Right. Well, it's like uh, stand up comedy. I mean, people I'm are just sure trying to get stage in- time, you know, people are just trying to practice their craft so no one pays especially in new york city or not no one but like you know yeah. most shows the vast majority it, it's, you kind of have to go through the grind i imagine it's similar for like comedians and and kind of you know probably a lot of different sort of creative endeavors where it's like in the beginning you basically get you know the shit end of the stick and then once you build a little bit of a reputation you can start actually you know uh having some leverage and trying to get more money for what you do it's also weird and i'm sure it's the same in street art it's like the more unique and like and i guess i don't know what the word is like the more you ruffle people's feather with your specific style of art um the harder it is to get paid early on and then the people who are really great at at being unique and kind of like controversial those people make the most money in the long term, but it's like in the beginning, those people can't find anything. Oh, definitely. Yeah. And it's, you know, I feel like especially street art because it's something that's put out for the public in a way that people tend to come across a lot. That's another sort of issue that comes up often is, uh, is, you know, what's getting paint, what's getting painted and where, Mm -hmm. you know, um, to give an example, there was this, uh, I, I believe she was Swedish not 100% sure on that, but there was, there was a European artist that came to New York to, uh, to paint some murals. And um, I guess the best way I could describe these murals as a uh, cosmic genitalia. Nice. It was basically space vibes, but mm. it was a dick and a vagina. And um, so she ended up painting this, like, I think it was like eight stories, like an eight story tall dick in Chinatown. And uh, the, the local residents did not care for it. <laughs> and end up uh getting taken down but the vagina state which is you know interesting in its own right i mean that does seem kind of racist to do it in chinatown more, <laughs> the vagina is more welcoming and opening for people to you know you know next are just violent by nature yeah inherently um you agree but, uh, Oscar? because you've been silent for 20 minutes i agree yeah just making sure <laughs> what i agree with everything yeah, <laughs> every absolutely everything. Um, yeah, so like you have a political background, you're getting into graffiti art. Um, how much do you find like, like do you when you're writing about graffiti and graffiti artists, uh, do you try to sort of find a through line in politics and uh, you know these different artists? Mm. So uh, at times, so so part of the idea behind up is that rather than just being like, oh, wow, this artist is cool, look at this art. We, we try and bring a certain level of uh, journalistic grit to what we write and what we publish. So a lot of times we'll use art as sort of a, a lens to view sort of broader issues. Um, so for example, we, we have a weekly, um, you know, we publish articles weekly on our website, but then a couple of times a year we, we do a print, we do like an actual print magazine. Uh, and for each of the print magazines, they all have a theme, right? And then that theme 
is the thread that kind of connects all of the articles and photos and artists in that issue. So the first issue we had done was money um, that we published June 20th, 2019. Uh, and kind of all of the articles are sort of about how money and art are related. Some of the stuff like what we were just talking about, how it's very hard art to get paid and, and things of that nature. The second uh, issue we published was travel in place, um, which kind of looked at, you know, how different cities have different scenes and how art develops differently in different parts of the world and also how traveling artists and gentrification. And then the issue we published last year, uh, last October, in the midst of the pandemic was um, community and culture. And that issue was really kind of like look at the history and the artists that really give back and, you know, how people kind of were coping with, uh, you know, all of the chaos of everything. And so the issue we're actually getting ready to print now is politics. And so this issue is sort of our send off to 2020. Uh, we have a bunch of articles that look at, you know, both the election, uh, the pandemic, you know, racial tensions, um, and not just in America, uh, we have a couple of correspondents internationally, like we have one article on censorship in China, uh, which I feel like is probably going to get me banned from ever being able to visit China. But oh, damn, you What's, know. can you can you tease that article a little? Yeah. So it's basically about censorship in particularly Hong Kong and how China has cracked down uh, more and more over the past few years. So for those that, you know, I guess don't know, uh, Hong Kong is sort of an interesting city because it was controlled by the British. Like basically during the time of imperialism, uh, England basically came into China and was like, all right, well, you know, we'll leave you alone, but we want this city. We're going to run this city and then you guys can have whatever else outside the city. Um, and so basically Hong Kong was, you know, sort of its own sort of special little place up until I want to say like 99 yeah, that's or right. maybe 2000 something in that ballpark yeah. Yeah. Uh, where I guess ownership of the city, for lack of a better way of putting it, reverted back to China. Um, and, you know, for a long time, the city kind of did its thing, but it really in the past three, four years, you know, they've gotten progressively more aggressive with the tactics used to sort of minimize dissent and, you know, place control on the city. Um, so what the article really looks at is, is that through an art lens, like we actually interviewed this one super talented artist, uh, Badakao. Uh, he does basically art that's very critical of the Chinese government. And because of that, he has had to flee China. I don't, he doesn't, you know, d publicly disclose his location. We had to communicate with him through like an encrypted uh, app, you know, wow. like that kind of serious shit. But it was really cool because he, he was giving his opinions on basically... You know, his attitude was like, art is is just about expression. And like, you know, if you try and clamp it down, like that's like one of the ultimate sort of, you know, crimes against, you know, humanity in a sense. Mm. Um, and then we looked at another artist who in that same article who would take uh, when street art is put up in China, it tends to get taken down very, very quickly. They have teams of people that just go out and like will paint over it in the middle of the night. Uh, so what this artist did was he would just take tape and basically tape it around uh, these buffed walls to bring attention to it in like a way of creating a frame wow. um, as sort of a meta commentary on censorship. That's cool. um, so yeah, that, that was, I think, one of uh, my favorite articles in this upcoming issue, just because it is, you know, very interesting and unfortunately relevant. Yeah, that, that does freak me out about China. Like, I, I mean, I'm trying not to be xenophobic and be like, oh, China's evil and America is so much better, but there are certain things where about free speech that just piss me off about China. Yeah. Well, I feel like, you know, no place is perfect, right? Like we've certainly got our fair share of problems everywhere it does, but I think at some point it becomes about cultural values. And I feel like, yeah, a lot of the, the values that are being, you know, presented in other parts of the world are sort of antithetical to sort of the Western mindset of where it's like, it is like, we put a lot of emphasis on the individual, right? And it's yeah. about the individual's right to speak and express and, you know, live their life as they see fit versus, uh, you know, more traditional, you know, Asian or, or really lots of other parts of the world outside the West. It's, it's more about thinking about from a community mindset, mindset. And so the idea behind 
you know, the philosophy behind sort of basically crushing any kind of dissent and stifling conversation is it's like, well, you're just creating problems for everyone. So it's better. You should just keep your mouth shut, you know? Yeah. But problems are how you get progress, you know, like that's how you realize there's something within your society that, yeah, is, is thriving. Now you are economically thriving. You don't want to disrupt that. Sure. But there's always tweaks that can be made along the way that won't disrupt it. Yeah. And I think the government is so conservative that they don't want to risk anything getting in yeah. the way of their dominance. Well, that's the whole thing of authoritarianism. It's like, you know, you, you can't let anything slide or the whole facade just comes crashing down. Exactly. You know? That's why they crack down so hard on calling Xi Jinping Winnie the Pooh. Yeah, like, every- that's actually one of the, uh, the, the pieces that the guy... Uh, in our issue, he was the one that started the Winnie the Pooh thing. Oh, shit. oh wow! Nice. Yeah, um, which is pretty funny, honestly. No, it's a great satire. You should call him yeah, Mr. Definitely. Winnie the Pooh. That should be his like wrestling name, <laughs> Mr. Pooh. <laughs> Winnie the Pooh. Uh, but yeah, didn't uh, I forgot some wrestler just apologized to China in China? Uh, yeah, John Cena just apologized because he referred to uh, Taiwan oh, as, as a country. Oh yeah. yeah, that that's insane. Yeah, well, I mean, that's the that's where the intermixing of people not wanting to lose out on their money, right? Like that's everyone's like, oh yeah, China, these atrocities, the Uyghur Muslims, but also, you know, I want I want Fast Furious Nine to make a billion dollars, and it's much easier oh. when China will show the movie. Uh, yeah, like I do not want China to take over Taiwan. That that's horrendous. I mean, it's such like a its own culture and. It's it's thriving in its own right. I mean, uh, that would be a, a horrible, horrible tra- tragedy if China just. Took, I mean, it's a tragedy already that they took over Hong Kong because that's such like a interesting, beautiful culture in its own right. And I just like, I don't know. Well, off of China, let's get back to Up Magazine's foundation. So you're writing for a long time. You're starting to do these freelance things. How does the formation of Up start to come about yeah so so basically i had been writing started 2017 you know chugged along to through 2018 i worked for a couple different places i I started doing enough that i was actually getting paid uh which was exciting and was sort of like you know validation it's like all right well shit i must be doing something right you know and so uh, i actually got hired by this one new magazine had hired me to fly out to California, they, they paid for my trip, which was also pretty cool, um, to, to go out to California and interview a bunch of artists. So I did. I went out and uh, I interviewed these several prominent LA street artists. Um, and I came back and they were basically like, hey, great job. You know, here's the paycheck, but uh, we're going in a different direction. We're not going to publish them. Uh, and I was kind of bummed because it was like, you know, I had put in a lot of time and effort into these articles and Plus the artists themselves were pretty excited to have it published. And, you know, it was just sort of like, oh, well, shit, that sucks. And I was kind of bitching and moaning to a mentor of mine. And he was like, well, why don't you start your own magazine? And I was like, I don't know. That sounds like a lot of work. I don't know if I want to do that. Uh, and I was right. It is a lot of work. But turns out I did want to do it. So I, I kind of came, came around on the idea probably like September, October 2018, um and then going into things uh i basically reached out to the only other street art writer i knew um at the time and then she brought on her friend from college who didn't who was an art writer but not a street art writer and then uh sort of through random connections we brought on this other guy as a photographer and so the first issue of up was the four of us um and it was just the four of us and basically from you know the end of 2018 to April 2019, we would meet in my apartment, which was on St. Mark's at the time. We would meet in my apartment like every day uh, and just write or discuss or work on things and basically just collab on, you know, putting this whole thing together. Um, And so, you know, the four of us created about uh, what ended up being about a hundred pages of content, about 15 articles, a bunch of photo galleries, um, you know, and, it was like, all right, cool. This we got this magazine, and um, you know, had a bunch of setbacks in the process. Uh, the mentor of mine, who was originally going to be sort of an investor, kind of walked away. Um, you know, 
we had gone to several different sponsors. Um, I actually had a series of meetings uh, with different investors and they were all uh, very interested on the onset. But then we're, by the end of the meeting, it was like, well, you know, uh, you guys are kind of untested. We're not going to put money on the table. So, you know, it was then we were like at six, seven months in and I was starting to get stressed and pressed because uh, printing is very expensive and I didn't have the money to print the magazine. And so I kind of had this like, well, put in all this effort, uh, you know, the fucking uh, YOLO moment. So uh, our parents had bought me um, life insurance when I was born. And, you know, over my 25 some years of life that, you know, that insurance was uh, accruing in value. When I turned 18, my mom was like, you know, you should, uh, you should hold on to this, but it's yours. You know, if you ever want the money, you can cash it out. And so I did. I ended up cashing out my life insurance, which was worth about uh, $14,000, which when you really think about it, isn't, isn't really that much. But I basically took all that money and invested it into the magazine, which paid for the uh, first issue and, uh, and a little then some. And so I, I should also note, I've been working part-time jobs throughout all of this in addition to writing. Um, but, you know, this was sort of the moment I was like, all right, I'm committing to this. This is going to be my main thing. And so, yeah, I, I basically was like, roll the dice and commit. We ended up printing 250 copies of the first issue and we had a release party and uh, it ended up being like an unexpected success. Uh, we ended up selling out all 250 copies. Like we had like almost 300 people show up to the party. Um, it was really cool. And so I was like, kind of like, oh shit, like there's something to this. Like I, I should really, you know, dive into it. And that was, uh, yeah, that was like two and a half years ago now. It's, it's, it's pretty amazing when you think about how often when and i'm not talking about recklessly jumping into something mm -hmm. but when you take a leap of faith that's well considered and deeply motivated how often it works out if not immediately at least in the long term for yeah. the best well that's that's my attitude it's kind of like you might as well fucking try it you know what I mean? Because it's like, otherwise you're going to spend the rest of your life with that sort of itch in the back of your head. Like, well, what if? Because, mm -hmm. you know, the worst that happens is you fuck up and you fail. And then it's yeah. like, well, all right. You know, I'm back to where I was anyway. Um, but yeah, I, I'm a big believer in taking risks, particularly sort of calculated risks. Because I feel like if you really, uh, you really invested in something emotionally, mentally, spiritually, whatever, you know, you'll, you'll go the extra distance to make it work, right. you know, and it becomes kind of a, a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yeah. And uh, whatever fails, at least people will see the effort. You'll also have the experience. And at the very least, people will be like, oh, actually, I need someone who can do that, you know, to help me with that, this thing, or I will back you the next time you do it or whatever. Yeah, exactly. So it's, uh, yeah, it's definitely, you know, been a bit of a live and learn. There's definitely been a, a lot of mistakes. I have made so many fucking mistakes. Well, that's a, it's incredible. You, like you start this magazine, you have to learn like all these like manager managerial skills. I don't know if that was correct, but uh, <laughs> word, Oscar. Word, Oscar. I, I just made up a word, you know, uh, <laughs> but yeah. Uh, what did you do to like, I mean, I guess you learned something from that story, but yeah. like right off the get go, like, how do you like, you know, gain like the organizational skills to try to figure that out? Or was it something that sort of grew slowly? Uh, it was definitely something that kind of grew organically. Definitely a lot of trial by fire. I think, um, you know, just like certain mistakes, like um, basically for our, our second issue, we printed. So the first issue, we printed 250 copies, right? The second issue, we printed a thousand because uh, I got some bad advice from, you know, certain advisors who was like, you should just jump up the production, which also uh, like tripled the cost. Um, and, you know, we weren't at a point where we could sell a thousand copies yet. So it was funny. We ended up having a lot of uh, issue two left over since have kind of moved all of those uh, those issues. We only have a handful left, but just like stuff like that, like learning through mistakes. I also started reading a lot of like uh, Harvard business, you know, little books. I'll, I don't know if I could reach them because of this fucking cast, but um, 
I have a bunch of books around my apartment. I could guess. I can show you guys real quick. A lot of them are on, you know, leadership insights and shit like that. Um, and so I tried to learn, you know, both sort of through experience and also through, uh, you know, through reading about other people's experience. Uh, I definitely still have a long way to go. I never really saw myself as a, as a manager, you know, even though I'm technically the CEO of opera, whatever, as some people have like called me, I don't think of myself in that regard. Cause it, it was really, it was like, I didn't start up to have a business, even though it, it is a business and I have to, to keep it alive. I have to treat it like that. You know, it started because I wanted to write about art and uh, I didn't like other people telling me what to do. And so I basically made my magazine to do that, you know, and, what I've really strived for is to, to give that sort of opportunity and that platform to anyone, you know, who's willing to put in the effort for it and uh, to, to publish, you know, people who do, do have, uh, you know, whatever opinions they want to get out there. And um, but anyway, yeah, as uh, being a manager, it's definitely been a lot of uh, learn as you go. And there's still a lot of going to get done. And uh, I guess to leave on, um, if you were talking to somebody who, had an idea or had an had an aspiration for a project or a pursuit what would be your advice on how to to go for it but also go for it with some legs under them yeah i would say be patient uh shit takes time um you know it seems pretty cliche but it's also pretty true um you know the first issue took almost 8 months to put together this politics issue, just because of all of the obstacles were going on, you know, nine months of putting it together. It's, uh, it's funny, you know, I, I said something to my girlfriend once, you know, I had people say, hit it and quit it. Uh, I say, hit it and commit it. <laughs> you know, if you're going <laughs> to do it, see it through one way or the other. See that thought over there? Marry her. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a good place to end, though, I think. Cool. Yeah. Well, thank you guys for having me on the, the podcast. Uh, quick, thank just you. promote uh, the Instagram and all your stuff real quick. For- so, uh, yeah, our Instagram is at up underscore underscore mag. Uh, the website is upmag.com. My name is TK Mills. Uh, check us out if you like thank street you, art. TK. Man, this was this was great. All right, guys. Yeah, this is awesome. Easy. Thanks for having me. Have a good one, man. Have a good one. Bye.